you gonna do with all that junk, all that junk inside your trunk? Good morning and welcome. You are tuned in and listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. I am your host. My name is Sharona. As always, I thank you for tuning in. The moment of truth has arrived. We've been promising, threatening, um, saying that we were going to discuss Juanita Broderick and the rape and sexual harassment claims against Bill Clinton and how that factors into Hillary Rodham Clinton and her bid for the um, presidential nomination for the presidential election. We will do that in our second hour. But first up in our sports hour, we we welcome back Robin Monday of uh, the Bills Mafia and the Bills Wire to talk about the Buffalo Bills. It's been a long, long time since we've done that. Robin used to be uh, a frequent guest on this show. In fact, was um, one of the the many uh, supporters of the show early on when we first started this. And it had been way too long since she and I had sat down and, and chatted. I had been intending to get her on the show. So fortunately, we were able to sit down last night and talk about the Bills, talk about the season that they're having, the Ryan brothers, Tyrod Taylor, uh, a lot of other different things. It was such a pleasure to to chat with her. And then we talked a little bit about the Thursday night uh, football game. We did not get an opportunity to do uh, NFL picks last week because we only did one podcast. That was Saturday morning. I had been fighting an upper respiratory problem, and it really has just – almost sidelined me it I'm feeling a lot better and thank you to everyone who's touched base with me and and wished me uh, well on getting better and I do feel better but it's actually just exhausted me and then you know it's interesting um, when we made the decision to to talk about the um, the debate the second presidential debate and these harassment and rape claims against Bill Clinton um, I, I knew that it was time, and I'm I'm glad that we're doing it. But I also I couldn't sleep last night because I kept going over and over and over in my mind how how to address it and how to handle it because I think we have to be sensitive about these things. So I didn't get a lot of sleep, um, but we're here, we're back, we're going to be real. Our second hour is going to um, to really delve into some things and. It's going to be hopefully an informative and, and interesting talk. But again, first up, our sports hour. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, my chat with Robin Monday uh, talking about Buffalo Bills, Tyrod Taylor, and a lot of other different things. So stay tuned in. You are listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. Oh my God, I go. He could go all the way. Touchdown, touchdown, touchdown. The Bills make me want to kick your heels up and throw your hands up and throw your head back and come on now. The Bills are making it happen now. All right, welcome back. I'm joined now by Robin Mundy. Robin is a friend of the show. It's been way too long since we've had her on. But in the early days, she was a very frequent guest and always such a pleasure to chat with. And, of course, she's a Buffalo Bills girl. And uh, so we're going to be talking about the Bills today. It's been a while since we've talked about the Bills. They are having a pretty good season, you know, so a little bit of a rough and tumble kind of season. But So without further ado, and by the way, uh, before we really get into the meat of things, as we probably, we are recording this on Tuesday night. It's about, it's a little bit after 6 o'clock my time, which is central time. And so I just sat down and poured a glass of wine, and Robin and I are going to chat about the Bills. But they're 3-2, and two, they're second in the AFC East, and um, we'll be playing this segment for Wednesday morning show, uh, where where we also intend to talk about the political elections that are upcoming, the second debate, and and um, all the 
brouhaha concerning the the Clinton accusers. We're going to go into in depth on that. But this is our for our sports hour, and so I'm happy to have Robin. Robin, come on in here and tell everybody uh, who you are, and and you know, we'll let you tell everybody where to find your work and 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 all of that uh, right now, and then again before you get out of here much but that's a nice introduction and i have to say i have been looking forward to this since we decided to I know do this too. today I'm, i've i've missed talking with you yeah, um been too long my name is robin mundy and i have been a lifelong buffalo bills fan i'm a retired oncology nurse and psychotherapist and i now write sports articles mostly about the bills for um bills wire which is Bills Wire USA, and you can find my articles there as well as I am still the editor in chief of our Bills Mafia group um, on Twitter, and we have oh goodness eight eighty thousand members now, wow. so it's doing very well. And as you can imagine, um, since we're talking about the Bills. Uh, it, to say that it's been an interesting season is an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, volatility rocks. Yeah. So we start out 0-2. Oh well, it, start, it started out with yeah. an interesting off season, and of course the mm. you know the addition of Rob Ryan and uh, and, and all of that, and you know Rex. Is is Rex is always going to be Rex, right? <laughs> but yes, he is. You know, and and we'll get to the coaching situation too. But um, you know, it's uh, it, it is interesting that those two have hooked up again and um, are now, you know, um, from all appearances, so far so good, doing fairly well. They are, and it didn't obviously start out that way when the Bills went zero and two, and all of Western New York was apoplectic as well as Bills fans around the world Um, and really uh, it was unexpected because of course good old Rex comes out and says we won the off season and Mm -hmm. promptly Reggie Raglan tears his ACL Shaq Lawson has to have shoulder surgery Uh, Marcel Darius goes on suspension Mm -hmm. I mean the list goes on and on Um, Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a very good start to the season. And then came Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that there were very many Bills fans that thought they were going to win the game against Arizona. Mm -hmm. And they played a pretty sound game. Mm -hmm. Came away with the win. And then, of course, we have the next game at Gillette Stadium and shut out the Patriots. I'm still in shock over that. Yeah, that was a huge win. It was. mm -hmm. It was a huge win. It was the, probably the biggest win the Bills have had since, oh, probably going back all the way to 2009. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, that's big. You know, New England has owned the division and owned the Bills for, oh, the better part of the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. And so um, that was very exciting. That was, a, I think that was a very significant turning point. Mm-hmm. And then they go out and play the Rams in Los Angeles Mm-hmm. Who are a decent team, you know, three and one, and yeah. the Bills have a horrible record on the road on the West Coast. They've only they well now they're nine and twenty six um, since 1970 mm-hmm. on the West Coast. So, so that was a really significant victory as well. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you know, here we have the a tale of two different teams. Mm-hmm. So who who are the Bills? Are they the Sea change afloat in the AFC East. I don't know the answer to that yet. Yeah, it, it is interesting, you know, and, and we like to to make these generalizations and say, oh, you know, look at what they did before and after we did this and and we did that. But every team is different, and you mm-hmm. know, and and even in in that little bubble, you know, team to team, different, you know, and you mentioned it, teams play differently. 
almost every game and you know a lot mm-hmm. of a lot of that's due you know to either injuries or you know guys who are unavailable or whatever and sometimes it's just you know it's the nature of the game that changes in inevitable and you know it's it's really hard to make these these generalizations were you I, I like Greg Roman. Let me just go ahead and start by saying that. I still think that he is a good coach. Um, I did not like the Bills firing him. Were you on board with that change? I was shocked. I mean, I will be just flat out honest to the core here. I was shocked. Um, I actually, when the Bills were 0-2, I was already in my mind, probably like other Bills fans, thinking, okay, well, if Rex goes, then maybe we could promote Greg Roman so we have some continuity on offense. You know, here we go, right? Here we go again, syndrome. Mm -hmm. And no, I was not prepared for that. And I'm probably even more shocked that the team has won three games since then without him. Now, that's a credit Lynn, no doubt. Um, he, but know, it was also like what he's been able. It was do. also a wake up call to players too, right? I mean, you don't make. Yes. It, I mean, it sends a signal that nobody's safe, and you know, um, you true. Can't, you can't discount that either. That's very true, and and I have to say, like you, Sharona, I have a great deal of respect for Greg Roman. Um, I. I'm certain that he's going to find another job very Mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, He doesn't have to worry about it for a couple of years because the Pagoulas will be paying his salary. They seem to like Um, doing that. They did, you know, they did that with um, Maroon. Correct. And actually they've done it with their hockey team as well. So they don't pull any punches in terms of, you know, if, if this isn't the direction that we're going in, then let's all do this the right way. Um, And respectfully. Yeah. Now let me ask you, there were mm-hmm. conflicting a little bit of conflicting reports about how involved the Pagulas were in that decision. What what are what are your thoughts on it? Were they how how involved were they? You know, you're right. There were the media was not consistent in terms of how that uh, part of the story was reported and it seems that um as I could distill different sources uh, it would appear that the Pagulas meet with players, and not in a formal way, um, but on a fairly regular basis. You know, they of course meet with um, Doug Whaley, the general manager, and uh, others while they're there. Um, and of course, since they own the Buffalo Sabres, they're there a lot. Um, and I think that. Terry Pagula in particular has always had a real congenial relationship with players. You know, at training camp, he's always hanging around on the field, talking to players, et cetera. I think he likes to have that open door policy of, you know, I'll listen to whatever you have to say kind of thing. And I believe that the, that, that relationship is kind of a back and forth thing. I don't know that there was any, structured formal meetings Mm -hmm. set up and conducted, you know, to investigate what's going on. I I didn't get the impression that it was handled that way. I think it was more, you know, you see somebody in the hallway, you talk, Mm -hmm. um, how are things going? Then if they have an issue, they feel free like they, you know, they being a player um, or staff member, you know, just go and talk. I I think that it's a fairly open door policy. So I suspect when this all went down, um, yeah, they made it a point to talk. I'm fairly sure from what I could distill that that's what happened. Now, again, I didn't get the distinct impression that this was some sort of formal process. Mm -hmm. But I think there was definitely communication there. And I honestly believe that the players probably feel fairly comfortable saying whatever they want to the Pagulas because they're very approachable. They seem to be. Yeah, it, it, it is an, an interesting situation. And, um, you know, at the time I would have said the defense was more because it happened after a game where <laughs> Ty, Tyrod Taylor put up, you know, really big numbers in terms of, 
uh, because I have him on my fan on several fantasy teams, and I'm keyed in to that aspect of it. And I watched the game, and I know it was a Thursday night game, as I recall. And um, <laughs> but yeah, um, it, it, it to me it felt like the ultimate scapegoating. But you know, um, the Bills have have won since then. Now I was looking. Um, at you, the the Bills' offense, in a lot of ways, is remarkably similar to the Titans. And um, right now, mm. the yeah, they putting up huge numbers in, in the rushing game, and uh, the Bills are third behind the Titans, who are second, and, and the Cowboys, who are first. Uh, but in terms of mm-hmm. passing yards per game, they're dead last in the NFL. Um, so it hasn't seemed to have had an appreciable impact on um on in and, and in terms of total offensive yards they're at twenty eight. So um mm-hmm. you know, it's interesting and I wanna we're gonna talk about the defense, but I wanna ask you about you know, because you know that I'm a big Tyrod Taylor fan and mm-hmm. um and I think that given the op, you know, given enough opportunity and time and patience that he can be that franchise quarterback that the Bills have really been looking for for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's always interesting to me, and um, I was not watching them, but I was watching my Twitter feed, and because we talk about the Bills a lot on this show, and um, I follow and have followers who are, are Bills fans, I, I tend to pay attention, and it does seem like he has not persuaded some of the media members up there. So I wanted to ask you, Robin, what you thought about Ty- mm-hmm. Tyrod Taylor's performance thus far in 2016. Interesting. Um, that's I think that's a very correct assessment in, in terms of how the media um, portrays their um, take on how Tyrod is doing right now. As you know, he has a um, structured so that the Bills actually have an option out after mm-hmm. this year if it doesn't if he doesn't meet the numbers that they hope that that he meets. Um, so you know there is a little bit more pressure on him um, than mm-hmm. you would ordinarily expect for a player that just signed a long term extension. Mm-hmm. Um, but that being said, I. I'm a Tyrod supporter. It, it's it, it's so interesting, Sharona. I swear we're it's like we are always on the same page. Mm-hmm. I am a Tyrod fanatic, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. I love the man. I love the football player. I I I love everything about him. He's he is everything that I would want in the quarterback of my favorite football team. Mm-hmm. He's respectful. Mm-hmm. He's you know, he carries himself, um, I think, in a very professional manner, and he is completely dedicated. I would even suggest that he's almost Peyton Manning-esque in his preparation. You know, he's the first one um, in the morning at One Bill's Drive. He's the last one to leave, Mm -hmm. and he leaves no stone unturned. And I dare you, by the way, try to find anywhere Anywhere, anything about his social life, mm-hmm. he doesn't yeah. have one. Yeah, and, and if he does, it's very undercover. Yeah, and again, uh, it it there are very remarked, mark, mark, marked. Lord, I can't talk. Marked similarities between um, him and Marcus Mariota in 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 mm-hmm. that way. Who's another guy, and uh, you know it's. We could have a whole right. yeah. We could have a whole segment on the perception between how different people perceive different quarterbacks and and what skill set they bring and and all of that because mm-hmm. you know it's it's very interesting and and I don't profess to follow everybody and and know everything but from and just judging on off of my uh, Twitter feed and the things that I see and the list that I have compiled and and have, it's uh, it there does seem to be 
some dichotomy between how people people perceive running quarterbacks like your Marcus Mariota, like your Tyrod mm-hmm. Taylor versus a guy, you know, like Jameis Winston, who is, you know, a prototypical drop back quarterback and it seems to me like and again I'm just judging from you know, from my um perspective, it seems to me that guys like Jameis Winston, who's been horrible this year, absolutely horrible this year, get a lot more leeway than guys like Marcus Mariota and, and Tyrod Taylor. Oh, for sure. And, you know, regarding Tyrod's talent, I think the only question mark that's left regarding his ability to be that franchise quarterback is whether or not he can calm down in the pocket. Yeah. And and that's really the only question mark that's left because his long ball accuracy, you know, and I don't think anybody can throw a prettier pass through a donut hole than he can on the run. You know, he's mm-hmm. he's gifted that way. But, and it's odd the way his gifts lie because as a true pocket passer, I think that's where he struggles the most. And Oh, yeah. I mean, he's still you know, settling down, trying to get comfortable mm-hmm. there. Yeah, and and reading his progressions. You know, last year, you can really see where he's growing. And, and that's the other thing that I think people, you know, people assume, okay, this guy's, you know, in his fifth year, what's fifth year, sixth year, that he's been in the league. And, you know, oh, well, he should be further along in his development. Well, he's been a backup quarterback. You know, he's only started like 16 games, I think, mm-hmm. for the Bills. And so, you know, we got to give him a little time to develop. But I do think he's got all the prerequisite skills to be that franchise quarterback. Hopefully the Bills will be patient with him um, and allow mm-hmm. develop as, as he needs to. I was not a fan of how they structured that contract. Again, I thought that it um, – and I don't want to bring race into it or or any of that, but I did feel like it was not as – I mean, look at what Brock Osweiler got in, mm-hmm. in Houston. And, and, again, it's a little bit – you know, I do think that race plays a part in it, but it's also that I think that we tend to, to we collectively, sports media collectively, tend to, and I don't because I value what a guy, a dual threat guy can bring. But I think that there is a at least a portion, I don't know how large you would quantify it, but I think that there is a large portion of sports media that devalues a quarterback that does not have that is not the prototypical big guy like Brock Osweiler, who's horrible, okay? They're, <laughs> they's not even, I mean, everybody's talking about buyers from worse and everything, yet he gets the big bucks, and you see what they did to Tyrod. It really did bother me. I understand that, but I guess where I would probably that in Tyrod's case, now I want to be real clear because I definitely agree with you that um, there are aspects of racism that exist throughout, you know, the NFL, you know, a lot of different entities um, today. Sadly, I believe that's the case. However, in Tyrod's case, I think that the real underlying issue in his situation was less about that and more about honest to goodness getting burned by Brian Fitzpatrick. And his then $60 million contract, which at that time was a lot of money. Um, imagine me saying $60 million isn't that big of a well, yeah, contract for like, quarterback. Yeah, but like the Texans haven't. Yeah. You know, maybe the Texans front office is oh. dumber, I, I guess. But what has Brooke Osweiler done? Nothing. I mean, Tyrod Taylor, well, that- Tyrod Taylor had a better track record. Oh. and got lesser money than Brock Osweiler. That's not even in in doubt. Well, that's true. And and that I you know, I I guess I don't know the Texans front office. I I really don't. I have no idea, you know, what their situation is like, but I can tell you that the Bills truly really and even the fan base um 
fan base. If you if you poll the fan base, the, there is a significant there are a significant number of Bills fans that aren't completely sold on Tyrod yet. Oh yeah, I, I believe and, that. I mean, it's clear that not even mm-hmm. a, a portion of the media is and. Right, and 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 I think that part of it, you know, plays into his particular situation. But I'm also sensitive to what you're saying in terms of, and this is the bigger question to me, is Osweiler get that contract? Mm-hmm. I think that was lunacy, to be honest with you. And that when it crazy. happened, I it, I was I was stunned. Mm-hmm. I was absolutely stunned. How many games did he play? How much tape did they have on him? I think he only played three games. He started three games. He might have played more than that. But, I mean, even old-ass Peyton Manning, who couldn't throw the ball <laughs> longer than five yards without it fluttering in the air, you know, replaced him. But they won the Super Bowl. They've got a great defense. And you can't discount the experience and, and the other kind of intangible things that, that Peyton Manning brought. And so I don't want right. to, I don't want to relitigate, so to speak, the the Super Bowl and, and yeah. all of that. It's set to say, wow, the Panthers are really struggling Oof. this year and I'm legitimately shocked by how bad they are. But um but we're gonna we're here to talk Bills. Surprising. And yeah, it, it's very surprising. And and also in, in Ty Rod's defense and a good comparison mm-hmm. we can stick with i mean we could talk about you know uh colin kaepernick we could bring him into this discussion too and he finally is getting his chance in in san francisco and again we're talking about some similar issues but it, but just focusing on the difference between um the the criticism that tyrod gets and what's going on in texas uh in houston with osweiler Look at what, and the Bills have a fantastic run game. Don't get me wrong, LaShawn McCoy is a good player, and um, and I like Charles Clay. He's, a, I think, a, a good tight end and and all of that. But, you know, Sammy Watkins is out. What does Tyrod have around yes. him where when you look at what Osweiler has, and he's sucking hard, and he's got all right. the talent in the world. It's Again, the Bills, yeah. the Bills would probably be really contenders in the AFC if they had the same wide receivers as the Texans yeah, have. Exactly. And 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 truly, without Sammy, you know, we've got Robert Woods, who's very good, and he's a very good all-around player. Not super fast, and he's not very big. Yeah. And um, you know, we've got well, Justin Hunter. Who just out of touchdown? So, <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm and, really you know, pulling for Justin Hunter. Yeah, good for him. Um, but he, you know, he's brand new. Yeah, you know, he's brand, brand new, new to the team. He just he doesn't know any anything. You know, in terms of the offense yet. Mm-hmm. And and so then we have Marquise Goodwin, who's extremely fast, mm-hmm. but um, somewhat fragile. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the knock on him. <laughs> although I. I'm just thrilled that that he's getting a chance to, you know, do his thing this year. I said um, I predicted when when those two were drafted, Robert Wood and him were drafted in mm-hmm. the same year, that Marcus Goodwin might end up being the better of the two. Um, but anyway, we'll 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 see how how that we'll goes. We'll see. They, you know, it's going to be interesting without Sammy there to see who is the one that's going to you know who really you know yeah. that is a question mark yeah. you know at this point and they're they're even looking at a guy um Walter Powell uh, he I think it was in the um New England game he had a very good game and mm-hmm. you know he's he's on the radar so they have a lot of unknown um entities basically at wide receiver and I agree with you that certainly reflects on um Tyrod you know in in terms of his ability to put up big numbers, mm-hmm. and you know we know what we we know what he can do. Mm-hmm. I think it's just a matter of let's see over the course of the next you know the rest of the season yes. how things progress with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, um, the more intangible aspects you know of a player's performance, just because that's where my mind has been most of my career, mm-hmm. and I think that Tyrod has the right mentality to approach his deficiencies and he's determined to do that and until we give him that opportunity I I think that we can't 
you know, we can't say, oh, well, he's just a quirky quarterback with some good talent here and there. You know me, uh, though. I, think, I, I get like a mama bear with my with my guys, and I just wanted yeah. to reach through the phone and smack. And I think you and I have talked about, and I'm not going to name names, I think you and I have talked about this particular um, Bill's media person who is a curmudgeon, I believe is what you called him. Um, <laughs> but, you know, yes. uh, he he's certainly not alone in having questions about about Tyrod, um, who I, I wish nothing for. By the way, I'm talking with Robin Monday of the Bills Wire, the Bills Mafia. Uh, we're, this sports hour is kind of devoted to the Bills. It's been way too long since we've really talked about them, even though I like them a lot and, and follow them fairly closely. Let's turn to the defense now and, and talk a little mm-hmm. bit about Rob Ryan. And you wrote an, a, a really good article for the Bills Wire about situational football and that defense, which, which by the way, um, I was just looking at NFL.com, looking at their team stats, the in total defense – The Bills are ranked 15th, and we'll get some of those individual rankings after that. Um, And and by the way, great. I I really loved you guys picking up former Titan linebacker Zach Brown, and he's having a fantastic year. And I just picked him up in an IDP league, and I'm very happy that I did. Oh, well, thank you. All I can say Thank you very much to the Tennessee Titans because <laughs> we are so happy to have him. Mm-hmm. You know, really, the the plan originally was to have him start. You know, when he was signed, that was the plan for him to be a starter. Um, mm-hmm. Doug Whaley, you know, you got to give Doug Whaley some credit here. He identified, he targeted Zach, and he said straight up that he was going after him because he thought he I'm sorry, Robin, you're cutting out just a little bit. I don't know if it's... Is that better? I don't know if it's your internet connection or mine. You said Doug Whaley targeted Zach Brown. Doug Whaley has a pretty good eye for talent. Um, Maybe not so much of a good eye for contracts, but... um, And, and, and numbers and things, but yeah. So he targeted Zach Brown, and, and then you cut out. Okay. He targeted Zach Brown, I think, in part because of his speed, but also mm-hmm. because of his coverage ability. Mm-hmm. And he had a very good idea what Rex Ryan was looking for. And that's the thing that impresses me the most about Doug Whaley, is that he seems to be able to exactly what it is the coach is looking for because the other guy he brought in that is just amazing is Lorenzo Alexander. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the guy's been in the league for 10 years. He's played for, I think, three different teams. And he had a total of nine sacks in his entire career. And he had three... All right, Robin, I lost you again. He has three. He had three sacks on Sunday. Okay, okay. And um, he's leading the NFL in sacks. Okay. And that's amazing, yeah. considering he's in his 10th year and he's been pretty much a role player. And Rex said that he hired him primarily um, for special teams help. Wow. But then when he saw him in training camp, he said, well, this guy can do our defense and run with it. And as a matter of fact, um, I don't, I don't know if the press conference Rex Ryan said he was asked by a reporter, um, "What are you going to do when Shaq Lawson comes back? How are you going to sit Lorenzo down?" Mm-hmm. He said, "I'm not gonna." Well, see, there you go. Much different answer from what Dallas, the Dallas Cowboys gave about Dak Prescott, which we'll oh. um, talk about. If, if Robin wants to weigh in, we can let her weigh in before she gets out of here. I was looking at the individual numbers. The Bills are ranked 13th in, in rushing defense and I believe 17th in, in, in the passing. Let's see here. No, 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 no. I'm sorry, 13th in uh, rushing defense. And let me... I pulled up the wrong thing. Passing defense, they are ranked, yes, yeah, 17th in, in passing cool. defense. Um, are you surprised by those numbers? Actually, I am. And I guess what it shows is the how terrible that Jets game was. Oh, okay. 
it, it, it is a little bit surprising. Um, you know, when you've got the well, NFL sack leader and you've got a guy that's, you know, d- tackling everything that moves. These are team stats. Uh, now, these are team stats. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, and, and it's still early on. There's still time for oh, assessment yeah. and and all of that. If you had to, to give a grade, and again, it's early, but if you had to give a grade to mm-hmm. – Rob Ryan and to the the changes that he's made in, in the Bills defense. How would you grade him and on a on an A to F scale? Right now, um, at this point in the season, a very solid B. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, above average. Okay. I think I I think what he's doing in particular is is somewhat unique because he doesn't really have a defined role on the defense. He does quote whatever they ask him to do. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that they asked him to do was to address red zone defense mm-hmm. because the bills were one of the league last year in red zone defense. And I believe now they're either number one or they're close to the top. And that can be attributed directly to Rex Ryan. The players even say so. Okay. Okay. So I, I the reason I'm giving him a solid B and not an A is I want more time. I want to see if they're be, they're going to be able to sustain this, and I think they will. Yeah, very very interesting stuff. What what are um, well, let me break it down into two parts. And again, I'm talking to Robin Monday from the Bills Wire. Uh, we're spending this um, this sports hour talking talking primarily about the Bills, and we'll talk about some other things. We'll get her to do a Thursday night pick with us. We didn't do NFL picks last week because we only did one podcast, and that was a Saturday morning podcast because I was sick, and I'm feeling a little bit better. Oh. I'm still a little bit Yay. under. Yes. And again, this is for the Wednesday morning podcast. So um, let me break it up into two parts. From a media perspective, what what do you think the expectations are? And then we'll talk about fan expectations because, and I've followed the Bills for a long time, and uh, and we know how heartbreaking the Bills can be for their yeah. fans, <laughs> <laughs> like no other team, yeah. maybe the Browns. Um, as far as the media's expectations, that's a hard one to gauge because the media varies. And I think sometimes the national media varies a bit from the local media. Um, and I oh, tend I to, mm-hmm. yeah, I tend, I tend to pay attention a little bit more to the local media because they tend to know all the players' names mm. um, and that <laughs> sort of thing. Um, and most of the, most of the local media, I think when the team went 0-2, they, they, they felt a similar swoon with the fan base, like, oh, my God, you know, is it possible they could just, like, totally tank again? Um, but now you'll see, like, for example, today was the first time I've seen a positive article written about Rob Ryan well, there you go. Um, was it in Vic? a long time. Was it Vic? But yeah, Vic Carucci. Okay. okay. And he's a wonderful reporter. He's been around for a long time in the Western New York community. He's been in other places, too. Um, but Vic is a, a terrific reporter, and he basically came out and said, look, it, if you guys don't think he's a good coach, you better think again. Mm-hmm. He's a good coach. And there's some good quotes in the article that I wrote um, that he made about comments that were made by players like um, Nikhil Roby Coleman for example, who had two interceptions and a pick six on Sunday, um, he said that he is learning about defense in a way very differently from Rob Ryan than he's ever learned from anyone else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that says something. So even though there isn't really a clearly defined role that Rob Ryan has, I think he he, he plays a very important part of tying everything together in that defensive scheme. And if you think about it, one thing that's interesting to me is how twins communicate with one another. Yeah. And mm-hmm. if you pay attention... They do have their own language. The, yes, they do. Yes. And you, it's really funny, but if you get a chance to watch the Bills on television and they show Rex Ryan on the sideline, you will almost always find Rob either on one ear or the other, just constantly talking to him, you know, throughout the game. 
And you can see that he's just so intent on making sure that everything's set right for his brother. And I don't know that you can actually quantify the value that you can put to that because he can see things through in a way that the rest of us can't. Mm -hmm. So I think that does add sort of a unique perspective. And it's really funny to watch him on the sidelines because Rex is always concerned about Rob standing too close to the sideline because his stomach will stick over. Mm-hmm. And he's afraid he's going to get penalized by the refs because his brother's stomach is too big. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, you know. So um, what about the fans? What what would the fans like to see? Is it um, – obviously you want your team to make the playoffs, but it, are the playoffs realistic? Well, they are now. They certain. I don't think you would have gotten a plug nickel for anyone to say that a few weeks ago. Um, I really don't. I think at 0-2 a lot of us were like halfway ready to write off the season. And, you know, rationally, which fans aren't because – as fans, we're not rational by definition. Um, but when we when we think about it, um, you know, the Bills making the playoffs, you know, at 0-2, you know, they showed all the numbers, 13% of teams, blah, 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 whatever. Um, the bottom line is that it's what they did mm-hmm. when they hit, and I hope, I can only hope that this was a bottom for them, You know, uh, they let go of an offensive coordinator. I mean, these are things that you don't really want to have happen, you know, early in the season. Mm -hmm. Um, And for whatever reason, it galvanized this team in a way where uh, maybe Rex said, you know, the perfect thing for us is to have to play Arizona and New England um, when they were 0-2. Uh, it, it was tough. The fans overall, I think, well, and you know this because you're, you're attached to the team somewhat as well. Um, the fan base is probably one of the most, I don't know, resilient is the word that Rex Ryan uses <laughs> about the fan base. And I would say that's probably yeah. true. But the word, yeah. the word, the word perseverance comes to mind. We persevere probably better than most um, given the circumstances that we've endured. But I think this fan base is very um, realistic. I I think the fan base, to be very honest with you, I'm not sure how they're going to handle if the bills are successful, to be honest with you. (laughs) It's like, okay, so they win these. It's hard for them to believe it. When is the next shoe going to drop? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and I think I like it's the, been sixteen years. I know, and I liked the comparison to, to the Browns. But I would also, if you would, allow me to compare them a little bit to the Detroit Lions too. Oh yes. You know. Oh yes. Absolutely. And that you know, that, that goes right back to nineteen sixty when you know, Ralph Wilson bought the team. He came from Detroit. And the first original team colors were the same as the Detroit Lions. So, yeah, we have we have our connection. The yeah. teams of the Great Lakes. <laughs> yeah. We often curse the curse of Lake Erie. That's what most of the Browns and Bills fans talk about. Yeah. Uh, Very interesting. Um, since we didn't do picks on... Uh, week, this is what, week six, so week five. Well, actually, before we even get there, I want to just real quick talk to you about, because we were talking about expectations, and I meant to ask you this. Um, You know, the Browns have, I mean, I don't know how to characterize it. They've got some winnable games on their schedule. I mean, they do face New England again, and Cincinnati, I don't know what to make of Cincinnati. And I think Oakland's a pretty good dang Football team, um, Pittsburgh. You know they've got. Ooh. Yeah, um, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh always, I think it, it's always Pittsburgh a tough is out. a good team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, always a good team. The but the, of course the big news is that um, uh, the the Niners are coming to town and they are starting a new quarterback, uh, somewhat new, at least new this season, and, and <laughs> Colin Kaepernick and. Um, and I want to ask you about that game. What do you think? How do you think the fans are going to? Because there has been a lot of controversy over his 
quote unquote protest, how do you think the fans are going to react to him? Oh, you know, it's hard to say. Um, if I go by my Twitter feed, I would I would have to say that I I think they're I think they're a pretty patriotic group. Yeah, I would say that. And and I think I would it, agree. Yeah, I I I think that's gonna that's gonna cause some uh, difficulty for for fans. Um, how they respond to that in the stadium, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but I I yeah, I think it, I think that's a that's a tough one. As far as the game goes, it's going to be a very big game. Um, the Bills haven't won three in a row for five years. Wow. And, yeah, and and so for them to have this next upcoming game at home um, is huge. And then they go to Miami and play. And, of course, Miami is kind of struggling right now. Oh, yeah, they suck. They're bad. The, ta- a, the Titans a good beat ch- them, so you know they're bad. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I I thought that the Titans played a really I thought they played a good game. Well, they did. And the big thing for the Titans and uh, we we talked about quarterbacks early on. The Titans have lost some really close games and I don't I'm not piling mm-hmm. on him because I'm a big fan and I've defended him and I'm going to continue to defend him. And I meant to mention this when we were talking about Tyrod too. Um, Marcus Mariota is in his second season, his second year, and mm-hmm. Tyrod's really only in his second season starting. And so, and people correct you know, patience is so um, underrated, and people Ugh. forget that these guys are in, in terms of starting and, and and what have you are very young and. And they're going to make mistakes. And I was going to ask you about the tie rod lining up in the wrong position thing, but I, we're, <laughs> we're wait, you know it happens. Put, give him a oh, break. Oh, for sure. He's, it, yeah, he's in his second season. You know, starting they, they asked him. I mean, I know he's not a veteran, but you know, cut him some slack. My goodness. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and I think he he laughed about that more than anybody else. He's so great, I love him. But back to the Titans, the the problem Uh that they've had, and I'm not trying to pile on him because I understand, you know, the game has been going very fast for Marcus Mariota this year, and he's turned the ball over. And um, you know, the big difference for the Titans this week, whether I mean, not turning the ball over and sustaining drives and getting points and and all of these things are good in so many different ways and it does allow your defense to play a little bit differently when you when you're ahead and you know and you've got mm-hmm. a comfortable lead and so it was a good win for them and I'm hopeful that they will you know sustain that and they've got the Browns uh, who have beaten them what twice in a row now in you know, terrible fashion so anyway um yeah, we'll see. We'll Interesting, see. and I I can tell you, I I keep my eyeballs on the Titans for yeah. two reasons. I have Delaney Walker on oh, my yeah. fantasy team. He had a good game, and I love. Oh, he's wonderful. Yeah. He's he's wonderful, um, and also Denora Searcy, yes, who used to be yes, a Buffalo yes. Bill, is a you know he and his wife are personal friends yeah. of mine, Aww. and um, he I know he's had an, a high ankle sprain. Yes, is he? He's not. He's still off with that injury, he did, isn't he? He was inactive this past weekend, and um, you know the Titans have to have their requisite uh, former Bill on the roster, and it it was George Wilson. <laughs> yeah, it was George Wilson and Andy Levitre, and now it's um, Denor, it's uh, Searcy, and and I love him too, and um, and we're, we're and of feel- course you have Mike Malarkey. He used to be yes. our coach. Yes. Yes, well, you know, we'll have to come back and we'll talk about um, Mike Malarkey because I didn't think that he had been given much of an opportunity in either Buffalo or Jacksonville, but that's neither here nor there. All right, so, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's it's definitely an interesting uh, schedule. You've got San Francisco coming up and then uh, Miami, as we mentioned, um, but New England travels to Buffalo. You've got, let me see, one, two, three, four, Wow. Are the rest of your – no, wait. One – okay, so this next game is at Buffalo. You travel to Miami. New England comes to Buffalo. And then you've got to really – right before you're by, you have to travel to Seattle and take on the Seahawks. And so that's, you know – Oh, that's, yeah. That's, um, that's going to be an interesting next four games before you get a bit of a break. 
Oh, for sure. And um, big game. And that, that circle your calendar for the Patriots mm-hmm. turn in Buffalo because that one's going to be turned up. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, interesting. Um, All right, so uh, before you get out of here, I want to ask you, there's so many other things that we could have talked about, but it's, you know, I want to let you get out of here. Broncos, Chargers, Thursday night. The Chargers, boy, they lost a heartbreaker last weekend. They could end up firing Mike McCoy, you know, before it's all said and done. The Broncos are really playing well. Um, How do you see this game stacking up? Well, I think the Broncos, I think the Broncos, although I would not be surprised to see the Chargers come in and do some damage. Chargers have um, been it's gonna be interesting. a thorn in the, the heel of the Broncos oh, on, yeah. Occasion. Oh, yeah. on occasion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem to matter, I don't think, over the years, what the record is of either team. When they play each other, it's a dogfight. Yes, it is. And. And I, that's why I, I don't know what to say about this upcoming game because Gary Kubiak, of course, is, is not going to be coaching yeah. in the game. And I don't think that should be much of a problem. But, I mean, you never know. Um, that's their head coach. Yeah. Did they – have they said – Alvinize them? It may not. And Who's going to coach? Have they said yet? I thought it was their offensive coordinator, but I could that's, be wrong. That's what I was thinking, Maybe. too. Although, you know, Wade Phillips has been a head coach, and so, anyway, yeah. Wade, Wade's good right where he's at. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, he does a, he does a fine job, you know, um, with defense, and mm-hmm. he always has. He's like Rex in that sense. All right, I lost you again, Robin. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. Am I am I there? You're you're there now. Okay. I I don't know what you know. I don't know what happened in the game against Atlanta. I was kind of surprised that they lost that game. Um. So we'll see how they do with the Chargers. I you know that could be a one game anomaly. Maybe. Not. Maybe they'll have a hangover. Yeah, interesting. Did I lose you? Yeah, a little bit. Oh. You you cut in and out a little bit on that. Um, I'm going to say as much as I do think that the Chargers will be up for this game, and uh, you know, and it, you know they've you know with Trevor Simeon being banged up and Paxton Lynch mm-hmm. clearly not ready. It it really in a short week. It really is a prime opportunity, I think, for the Chargers to get back on track. And, and I certainly do think that they could win this game. But I think that the Broncos are going to win it. That's my sense of the situation. I think the Broncos will ultimately win, but I don't think it's going to be easy. Yeah, no, I don't either. And then I expect it to be a closer game than – they always do kind of seem to be close – Mm -hmm. Um, Robin, it was such a pleasure. Tell everybody again where they can find you on social media and find your work. Okay. On Twitter, I am Robin Mundy Wyo, and that's because I live in Wyoming. And it's at R-O-B-Y-N-M-U-N-D-Y-Y-W-O. Also, I'm the editor-in-chief at Bill's Mafia, um, which is Buffalo B-U-F-F-A-L-O, FAM, F-A-M as in mother, FAM base, B-A-S-E dot org. And you can find articles that I write for Bill's Wire at billswireusatoday.com. Very, very good. It was a pleasure, Robin. I hope you'll come back soon. Oh, I hope so, too. I love talking with you, Sharona. Me Thank too. you for your time. Have a great evening. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Right. Good night. I woke up and wished that I was dead With an aching in my head I lay motionless in bed I thought of you And where you gone Let the world sing by them Back, shout out to Robin Mundy again for joining me in our sports segment to talk about the Buffalo Bills, Tyrod Taylor, the defense, how the the Ryans are doing this season. It's always a pleasure to talk to Robin and and have a conversation with her. By the way, we will be doing another podcast later on this week 
probably Friday. You can stay tuned to my Twitter feed for information about that. You can follow me on Twitter at Sports by Sharona. Uh, and if you want, let me know. Uh, always looking for different points of view. Um, disagreement is good as long as it's handled appropriately, and uh, we can. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, disagreement uh, about the the political climate and the elections, and we're going to, to be talking about that here in a few minutes. You know, disagreement is good, and and discussion is good, and debate is good, and it, but it's all in how you handle it. And I think we can all do a little bit better in in how we do those things. I've been, I know for me personally, I've been working a lot on on those things and you know I've made a lot of mistakes in the past and you know mistakes are fine if you learn from them right and and so I, I certainly have been striving to do a lot better in terms of of disagreements and and what have you and again we'll be talking about the second presidential debate and we're finally going to have that discussion that we've been promising you that we would have Regarding Bill Clinton, uh, the women who have accused him of sexual harassment and rape, as well as the uh, Kathy Shelton situation. Uh, Kathy Shelton was a 12-year-old child who uh, had accused a, a, a man of raping her, and her defense lawyer was Hillary at the at that time was Hillary Rodham. She had not yet married Bill Clinton. She was appointed to the case, and we're going to to talk about that situation as well because it is those four uh, four women who have um, who were at the the debate and who have been used as evidence that um, Hillary Clinton does not. Uh, support women, does not like women. There have been claims of intim- of intimidation and what have you. So we're going to talk about an hour. But back to Friday's show, we'll bring you your fantasy football fix, uh, this week's NFL picks. We did go ahead and, and, and do the Thursday night game. Uh, also, tonight's Going for Two has been rescheduled. It will be shown tomorrow night starting at 8.30 Eastern Time. Uh, you can watch that via YouTube Live. We'll be tweeting out a link to to that. And Mike Wallert is going to be joining us to talk about the Cleveland Browns and, and the big hot matchup between the Tennessee Titans and the Browns this weekend. Can the Titans get a little bit of that monkey off their back and, and actually, you know, beat the Browns? Um, you know, the there was the infamous comeback game a few years ago and then Last year, I believe they actually just flat out beat them, and and so we'll see. We'll 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 talk about that game, and you know the Browns. I, I really love their head coach Hugh Jackson, and but you know their quarterback situation is wow, it's just awful. Um, so many injuries. Injuries are a part of the game. They're they are. You know, I think it would be fair. Separate part of the game, but. They do happen, so we'll we'll talk about that and um, some fantasy football. Mike is my go-to guy when it comes to IDP, and so I'm anxious to ask him about Jack, uh, Jack Zach Brown, who the Buffalo Bills picked up um, from. He was not uh, his contract was not renewed by the Titans, and he's having a fantastic season um, for the Bills. I'm anxious to ask Mike about that. Mike is always giving me. Great I love playing in IDP leagues, so that should be a fun discussion. And also, uh, I'll be sitting down tonight with Matt Wood, our uh, weekly episode. We didn't do one last week for a variety of reasons, but we will be doing one this week. You can hear that on Friday. Uh, Tonight's discussion is going to revolve around Yahoo, the the security concerns with Yahoo and and the lawsuit that was just filed against Yahoo and its CEO for discrimination by um, one of the former editors there, a man who is claiming that, um, I don't like the term reverse 
racism or reverse sexism. It's all, it's either racism or sexism. Um, so the sexual uh, discrimination lawsuit against um, against Yahoo. So we'll discuss that as well. But we're going to take a, another quick break right now, and then when we come back. The moment of truth has arrived. We're going to have this discussion about abuse, about the presidential elections, about Donald Trump, about Hillary Clinton, Paula Jones, Kathleen Wiley, uh, Juanita Broderick, and Kathy Shelton. Uh, and by the way, Sam B. is um, a treasure. And if you're not paying attention to her, if you're not watching her show Full Frontal, uh, you definitely need to get on that because she. Her takes are on point, so stay tuned in. You are listening to Back Talk with Sharona. Yesterday I cried. You must have been relieved to see the softy side. I can understand how you'd be so confused. I don't envy you. I'm a little bit of everything. All right, welcome back. You're tuned in and listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. I am your host. My name is Sharona. Once again, thank you for tuning in. This is going to be a very hard segment for me. I mentioned earlier, I didn't really sleep last night. I didn't sleep that well because even though I've been wanting to have this discussion and and I know that it's an important discussion, I've been dreading it too because there are um, there are, are, are good ways to handle the topic of abuse, of harassment, of assault, and, and there are bad or insensitive ways. And, and I want to be sensitive to to this topic and the issues. I understand um, in particular Juanita Broderick and her desire, her – it her desire to be believed. But let's talk, let's start with a little bit of a discussion about, um, you know, about the, the, the second presidential debate and the, and the coverage. And first, let me give you a disclaimer. If you've listened to this show for any length of time, especially early on, when we first started talking about this election, you know that I was very and have been very ambivalent about Hillary Rodham Clinton. And I know that I'm not the only one to feel this way. And I went looking for it. I couldn't find it. There was a very good article by a a supporter of Bernie Sanders who had similar reservations and similar feelings that I did about Hillary Rodham Clinton. And she wrote about how she underwent this metamorphosis. And it was so... It felt so familiar, and it, it it really kind of tracked how how I felt. If you know the article that I'm talking about, please send it to me because I definitely want to include it in our links and tweet it out for you guys. But you know, as I've watched this this election unfold, and as I've watched the coverage of the election unfold, it's it's really been kind of an, an epiphany for me. And I realized that my feelings about Hillary Clinton have been colored by the coverage of her. She has been in the public eye for as long as I can remember. She's been a part of of that, um, you know, of that political coverage, you know, early on as, you know, Bill Clinton's spouse and the first lady of Arkansas. And of course she was an attorney and she had a career in her own right. And, and obviously a very smart, smart woman, which I think is in large part responsible for a lot of the hate that she gets. We'll get to that in a minute. But I realized that a lot of my ambivalence was due to that coverage. And but as I have matured and and really given it some thought, you know, really spent some time in introspective uh, thinking about why I felt the way that that I did about her, and it a lot of it had to do with with the coverage, as I mentioned, but also with 
Yeah, and I think that this is something that that women do tend to do, and that is projection. We project onto each other how we would handle a particular situation, talk about something, or how we would do something. And when we don't, and when we see another woman do something differently or handle things differently, um, I think sometimes we do struggle with that. And 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 what I'm talking about in particular is how uh, Hillary Clinton handled her marriage to Bill Clinton. And and I think that that's been a struggle for a lot of people, especially a lot of women, you know. But when but it's interesting because people do tend to, it seems like people do tend to forgive Donald Trump's spouse. Melania isn't as much, obviously, isn't as much in in the public eye and does tend to stick to that tradi- quote unquote traditional role as, you know, a homemaker and a mother and, and all of that. And you don't see her out giving, um, you know, representing child rapists and, um, you know, being a, a, a mover and a shaker in a political world. And, and, um, and so all of these things I think are kind of tied up in, into our perspective. Uh, of Hillary of Hillary Clinton, and for me personally, because I've been up close and personal in the political um, arena and have dated a politician and have had to deal with some of the 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 same things that Hillary Clinton has dealt with, and because I handled them differently and I did things a little bit differently, um, I think that that kind of colored my perspective of her. Um, but you know it's hard. What you know when when you have when you're married to someone or you're in a relationship with someone, dating someone, whatever, with a wandering eye. In, in Bill Clinton's case, probably a little bit more than that. You know what do you do? Do you stand by your man? I mean, it's like women are damned if they buy your man. Do you you know do you leave your man? And we've had this discussion before. If Hillary Clinton had divorced. Bill Clinton, the narrative would be, well, she couldn't make her marriage work. What makes us think that she can run this country? You know it. I know it. If you're honest with yourself, you know that that's true. That would definitely be the narrative. But she didn't. She didn't divorce her her husband. She stayed with him and you know, weathered all of those storms. Um, and And I think that it's been hard for for women to, I mean, we've struggled with that, with how we feel about that. I know that I have personally, and I don't think that I'm alone here. You know, but the coverage of her it, it has definitely been a factor, I think, in how people perceive her. And it's really continued on into debate coverage, the the election coverage, which has at best been inconsistent. I know that there are some media pundits who want to think that, uh, the coverage has been generally good. I would take issue with that. I think inconsistent is probably the best word for um, for the coverage. And, and that became even more glaringly apparent to me as I was watching the second presidential debate and the aftermath Actually, even before that, leading up to the second presidential debate and and the aftermath and the coverage and and how the the headlines were were screaming, oh, you know, like they went after each other and, you know, it was a knockdown drag drag out and, and all of this when I was like, what which debate did you watch? Because while. Donald Trump definitely spent a large portion of the time attacking her personally. For the most part, she she stuck to the issues and and between the two answered the questions far more consistently than you know than he did. Yet the headlines in the coverage made it sound like that it was it was equal and it wasn't equal. That I that I feel the the coverage has has been in 
what is probably an unwise decision to try to be objective in a campaign that's anything but. There has been an overreaction by the media to 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 try to balance coverage and and it really has i think factored into into the perception uh, of Hillary Clinton but i want to get to to these four women and i want to talk about that um but but before we leave the coverage i i want to say the other thing that that struck me about it was all the headlines congratulating Donald Trump and saying that he won all over himself, and yet Hillary Clinton, who came across as so uh, to me, and it was so amazing because I I watched this debate and I was like, you know, this is her finest moment. It really was kind of the moment where I was like, okay, you know, I'm happy to support this woman because she came across as so smart, and I, it, you know, as I rage watched this debate, I was amazed at how she was able to, you know, to remain calm and and to smile and and to handle this blundering turd that was stalking her all over the stage. You know, it was one of her finest moments, and I couldn't under, it, watching the coverage, the post Debate coverage was was kind of amazing to me, but I want to talk about the um, the four women who appeared on stage with Donald Trump. And um, the here's the thing that, and this is why I really struggled with wanting to even to, to discuss this because I do think I do think that you have to be sensitive who who is a victim herself. I I understand sensitivity, how the, um, you can look into a lot of different things and find inconsistencies. And of course, those are the major things that, that generally are brought up when you talk about Paula Jones, when you talk about Kathleen Wiley, when you talk about Juanita Broderick. Um, and even when when you get to Kathy Shelton, and, and we're going to finish up with her, because to me, um, I, I feel probably I feel sorry for all of these women, really, but I probably feel the sorriest for her. And, and I want to talk about her last, and, um, and and really have a discussion about that. But we're going to talk. We're going to start with with Paula Jones. And but but before we get there, I want to say this. When you're talking about abuse and you're talking about the dynamics of truth and believability, it's important to remember one thing. There are no perfect or typical victims. Point blank period. And I can assure you that victims desperately want to be believed. Because if you make a claim of abuse, harassment, rape, assault, whatever, against any man, but particularly a man who is in a position of power, who is, um, who has money, who has fame, who has the, who has every advantage over you that you can think of. Um, it, you know, it's, you know, that you're going to be outnumbered and you know that you're automatically going to be disbelieved. You know what's at stake and you know what you're going to be put through and none of it's going to be pleasant. So um, it's important to remember that. And, and, and that's why I want to be sensitive about this because I understand that there are going to be, inconsistencies okay they're going to be things that don't necessarily um you know that don't necessarily track and and i understand that and so you know it, i think it's important to remember that there are no typical victims here so we're going to take a quick break 
let me lubricate my vocal cords because, again, I've been dealing with this um, upper respiratory infection. When we come back, we're going to talk about these women, so stay tuned in. You're listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. All right, welcome back. You're tuned in and listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. I am your host. My name is Sharona. Again, I thank you for tuning in. So, all right, let's talk about this. Paula Jones, probably the first woman that um, that anyone heard of when it comes to Bill Clinton and his alleged infidelities. And I and I kind of roll my eyes a little bit when I say alleged. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that Bill Clinton uh, at the least is a horn dog or was a horn dog. We don't know. Well, I don't know what he's doing now. And and you know, here's the thing. I try not to get into people's personal lives and in relationships. And we've talked about that a lot on this show because you know, what makes a, a relationship work is is personal to to the two people that are in that relationship. And but when you're running for president as as the old saying goes, everything is fair again all all's fair in love and war, right? So Paula Jones is probably the first woman, right, that that anybody heard of when it comes when it came to Bill Clinton and women and harassment and she uh was a uh, a woman who filed a actually, actually filed a sexual harassment against Bill Clinton, and um, we, we will talk a little bit about the details um, simply because um, I think it's important to set a little bit of that background. But uh, the he, Paula Jones, she, and she filed her lawsuit back in 1994. She worked for the state of Arkansas in one of their um, political commissions. It was the Industrial Development Commission. I'm looking right now at a Vox article. We'll be tweeting out links to all the articles that we are using just as a reference point. Um, She claimed that he invited her back to his hotel room. Uh, Advancements were made. She rebuffed them. And, um, you know, he made sexually suggestive remarks, tried to kiss her. And then at the end, she said that he said, you are smart. Let's keep this between ourselves. And this was a big lawsuit. It dragged on for a number of years. And it's important because there, because um, Juanita Broderick, who we're going to talk about in a minute, made an appearance in, in this lawsuit and, and the infamous affidavit that um that she signed where she recanted her claims against excuse me against Bill Clinton and uh, ultimately that lawsuit um a federal judge granted summary judgment in, in Clinton's favor it went up on appeal it was ultimately settled for uh, $850,000 and $200,000 of that went to Paula Jones. The other went to her attorneys for their legal fees, and Bill Clinton admitted no wrongdoing, um, which is typical in, in, in settlement agreements. So um, the the evidence in that case, and we're not going to – again, we'll tweet out some links to this. The evidence in that case were, were kind of interesting, and there, as they're typically – are there were some inconsistencies? Listen, I don't have any doubt believing that you know Bill Clinton made advancements to her that she rebuffed them or whatever. One of the the more infamous aspects of this was the whole thing about his penis, and it, she said that there was a, an identifying mark, and then then that became a, a comment about his anatomy and there was some you know and then we had monica Lewinsky of all people coming in to say well you know um no that's not true it's perfectly normal penis you know and it was 
at the time really an embarrassing you know kind of thing and he ended up getting impeached and, and all of that and what is is and 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 but I think it's important to note that Bill Clinton is not running for president it is Hillary Clinton and what do you how do, do you hold this against Hillary Clinton that Bill Clinton is a horn dog and let me tell you something if if you're going to be holding um, men being horn dogs against women. Well, there are a lot of women out there who um, who shouldn't have jobs, right? Because there are a lot of horn dogs out there, <laughs> um, and, and you shouldn't do that. Okay, you shouldn't do that. Women should not be held responsible for the actions of of the men in their lives. And the thing that that Paula Jones has said is that um, she she just wanted Hillary Clinton to believe her, and then that's the only thing she hasn't made any claims of harassment. She hasn't, um, you know, she hasn't said that Hillary tried to intimidate her. There's no evidence of any of that, um, but she does support Donald Trump later on. The support of Trump. We'll get to that later on. So, you know, the, and, and you know, and it reminds me, and, and if it's true, and I, I, I tend to believe Paula Jones. I know that there are inconsistencies, and uh, okay, and 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 I understand what she says when she says, "I want Hillary Clinton to believe me." But again, you're asking, you know, you're asking a woman to, you know, to. Uh, and I think that Hillary Clinton loves her husband. You know, I, I, I believe that. I believe that she loves her husband. And what do you do when you love someone and, you know, and and, and it's like that? Um, it, yeah, it reminds me, and we talk about this scene a lot, and it was in our wrap-up of our last podcast. It reminds me of the scene in How to Get Away with Murder where um, – you know, uh, Viola Davis and Cicely Tyson are having this mother-daughter communication, and Viola Davis is upset with her mother because she knew that she was being abused by a family member, and she felt like she wasn't, she didn't do anything to stop it. And, you know, we do think, I think we do tend to think that women can do it all that we can stop it you know we can stop everything and we can make everything better and you know we have that god i wish we had that kind of power you know to stop to to be the one to stop abuse to be the one to make marriages perfect to be the one to you know to make the world and i think we can make the world a better place but there's such an, an enormous pressure on us to to do it all. Um, so 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 that's Paula Jones. And again, we're going to talk about the the, the Trump support later. Now let's discuss Kathleen Wiley, um, Willie Wiley, her sexual harassment claim, which is um, more troublesome in terms of proof for her um, than Paula Jones and her claims of intimidation. Uh, I had not taken a look at her Twitter feed until I started prepping for this show. And boy, no one comes out of that one alive. Um, It's disgraceful. Let me just say that it is disgraceful. And and especially the things that she has to say about Barack Obama are are disgraceful as well. Um, Here is what uh, in just a little bit of, of, of a background the Kathleen Wiley, Willie Wiley a- accusation. Um, in 1993, she was a volunteer in the Clinton White House. She had met him at a 1989 campaign event. Um, they had a private meeting, and um, at the end of the meeting, uh, and she was wanting a job. At the end of the meeting, she claims that he ran that Bill Clinton ran his hands through her hair, kissed her, and fondled her. Um, who she told and what she told after that has been disputed by the parties involved. Um, but, but 
and the infamous Linda Tripp thing co- comes up. Again, we'll be tweeting out the links to all this. But what I want to focus on, uh, and, and in fact, this in, in the Ken Starr investigation, one of her, I believe one of her witnesses was charged with perjury. And anyway, it's interesting. But she is the, she is one of the women to claim that and this is the troubling thing. This is the thing that I want to address, the claims of harassment and intimidation by the Clintons, in particular Hillary Clinton. And so I took a look at it, and there really, you know, there just is no evidence that that links either one of the Clintons, but in particular Hillary Clinton, to intimidation. Uh, the, the, the things that... Um, that she has talked about, um, and I'm trying to, to find this. Let's see. Uh, well, the, she she blames them for her husband committed suicide, and she she blames them for that, which is has been completely and utterly debunked. Um, but there was there was a uh, a cat. Or skulls. There's something left on her doorstep. Some man made a comment to her, and there was someone lurking underneath her window. And and these are the things that she points to as to intimidate her. And there and again, there's just no evidence linking any of that to the Clintons. But what troubles me the most about about her is that there is evidence that she was paid by um by Donald Trump or or his allies to um to uh, to make outrageous claims against the Clintons and to to make these appearances and do these things and uh you know that it just makes me wonder what you know what's going on here and and I know that there there was evidence about um outside of even the harassment claim about her having financial trouble listen people people have financial trouble women have financial trouble that happens okay um so I don't even want to get into any of that you can look at that and judge that um on your own but again that there there is just there's no evidence here and I went looking because if there was, I wanted to discuss it, but there's not any. So, um, all right. So now let's talk about Juanita Broderick. And Juanita Broderick, her claim is not about sexual harassment. She claims that Bill Clinton raped her, and um, which is, you know, in, in the larger scheme of things, a more serious claim. There was, there have been some really good articles um, that have been done about this. The best one, one of the best ones that I saw was on BuzzFeed, and it was by Katie Baker, who, um, and this was, let's see, August 14th, 2016. We'll tweet out a link to this, and um, it goes into detail about it and again there were inconsistencies there was the infamous affidavit where she recanted her claims against Bill Clinton I'm not going to get into all that I want to focus on her claims of intimidation about against Hillary Clinton and why she feels like Hillary Clinton does not support women and it the claim of intimidation arises out of a uh, an encounter between the two. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gonna have, we're gonna have to take a quick break. I'm gonna lubricate my lungs again. I'm sorry, you guys. I know um, I've been dealing with this vocal, this upper respiratory infection, and my I, I'm going to need to lubricate my vocal cords. We'll get to Juanita Broderick when we get back. You're listening to Bat Talk with Sharona, so stay tuned in. We'll be right back. <clears throat> I 
All right, you guys, I'm sorry. Welcome back. You're tuned in and listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. We were just about to get to Juanita Broderick. We had to take a quick break. Um, I'm lose my voice before the end of this show. We're roughly 30 minutes away from the end. We still got one more claim to go after Juanita Broderick. Her the the intimidation and harassment that she claims against Hillary Clinton came at came by product of a brief encounter that she had with her. Uh, it was 38 years ago. It was at it was at a state political event. This conversation. Um, and, and this is her own, this is Juanita Broderick's own personal account of it. She came directly to me as soon as I hit the door. She caught me and took my hand and said, I'm so happy to meet you. I want you to know that we appreciate everything you do for Bill. And um, it, that's it. That That's, that's the entire thing. Um, and, and, you know, and it, and look again. I sympathize. She's she's another one who says some really stuff that's really hard to for me to countenance. But I sympathize with her. I know what it's like to want to be believed. I know what it's like to um, you know to struggle with with these issues. And I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt that this did happen. Um, and again, though. How you know? What do you do? How how do you hold? How can women be held responsible for so many things? <clears throat> but this intimidation is is very um, questionable. But I understand that you know, for her, you know, maybe she's struggling. She's struggling with this incident and. Uh, you know, and she wants Hillary to come up to her and say, you know, I believe you, I support you. I mean, I can understand that. I think that it's impractical. I think that it's asking a whole lot of uh, uh, of someone to do that. But, you know, I can understand that maybe she does want that. I can understand why any of these women want that. But again, I think that it's asking a whole lot to you know, to want that, but this is, this is it entirely, and, you know, it assumes that, um, you know, that at the time that she even knew, because Juanita Broderick didn't come forward for a long time, and, and that encounter took place before any of the later events, so, you know, it's tenuous, tenuous at best, but she is also another woman who supports Donald Trump, we're going to get to that in a minute, okay? We're not – we're the, – the Trump support we're going to get to. Trust me on that. So, all right. Kathy Shelton. This is the one that, um, you know, that I really want to talk about. Kathy Shelton was 12 years old when she was raped by her own account and uh, okay allegedly we'll we'll use the word allegedly I'm not going to question her account okay I, I I'll assume for the purpose of this discussion that that she was and you know and I sh- I hate to use the word assume okay let's say that she was raped and 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 that this thing happened the the Hillary Clinton connection was that at the time she was Hillary Rodham. This was before, this was back in 1975. Um, and Shelton, by the way, was raped by a 41 year old factory worker. His name was Thomas Alfred Taylor. Um, the Hillary Clinton connection Rodham. She had not married Bill Clinton. Um, she was a lawyer. She had just moved to Arkansas. Uh, she was getting ready to to marry Bill Clinton. She had just moved to Arkansas, and was the she was appointed to the case to get her wishes. She didn't want to represent this man. Uh, she was appointed because he fired the defendant, the man who was accused of raping Kathy Shelton, 
um, fired his attorney and said he wanted a, a woman as a, as a lawyer. And Hillary Rodham was suggested and appointed by the judge. She tried to get out of it. The judge would not let her. And so against her wishes, she was forced to zealously defend this man. And I use those words deliberately because that is what the the ethical guidelines say you're supposed to do when you represent someone. You're supposed to zealously advocate and represent them. And she was forced to do that. And as a result of her representation, we're going to get into a little bit of the details here. As a result of that, the charges were reduced down. They were reduced from first-degree rape to the unlawful fondling of a child under the age of 14. Now, there's a reason why those charges were reduced that don't have anything to do – well, actually, they do. But they were reduced in large part because the prosecutor mishandled the case. Not Hillary Rodham Clinton, the prosecutor. But what – what Kathy Shelton is upset about, according to her own statement, what she is upset about is that um, Hil- that she she believes Hillary Clinton laughed at her. But the evidence, and we're going to talk about it, the evidence doesn't support that. I'm sorry, the evidence doesn't support that. That comes from an interview. That she did, that Hillary Clinton did, and and by the way, um, Kathy Shelton, this happened back in 1975, but she never came forward publicly until this year, until 2016. Um, She didn't even realize that the man who raped her, that his defense attorney had been Hillary Clinton until 2008, and then that was after there was a newspaper article discussing it and that's how she stuff until much 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 later <clears throat> but what she's upset about is that um there was an interview and I'm pulling it up right now okay there was an interview that was con- that was conducted back in the 1980s <clears throat> excuse me where Hillary discussed the case with Roy Reed you can. Uh, we're going to tweet out a link. You can hear the audio, the actual. I know actual facts here, right? You can hear the actual audio. And uh, there were four times that she, that Hillary Clinton laughed during this interview, and none of them were at Kathy Shelton. <clears throat> um, the first one, and the one that I think is the the most important one was when she detailed the part about it where um, this man claimed that he didn't rape Kathy Shelton and that he took a lie detector and she had him take a polygraph when he passed. He passed this polygraph and she said, this forever destro- destroyed my faith in polygraphs. And that's that's the big one. That's the one that that she has pointed to as evidence that um, that she laughed, but she's not laughing at Kathy Shelton. And and I and, you know I can understand where Hillary Clinton is coming from here because as a very 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 young attorney, I was put in in a similar situation. And fortunately, I was able to to get out of it. I was asked to defend a man who had been accused of child rape. Uh, we also sent him to um, – he came in, told us the story, was sent to take a, a lie detector test. Well, he didn't pass, and um, the story, as it became more clear and started unfolding, was much different from the one that had been initially presented to us, and you know, I just knew in my heart that I could not give this guy a zealous defense. And so I was able to, to fortunately not have to do that. But I can sympathize with her. You know, here she is. She she doesn't want to represent this guy, but it's her job to. It's her job to zealously represent this 
man who's been accused of all crime, and that is the foundation. It's the cornerstone of our criminal justice system. That you know, and it's a good one. It, you know, we have to make sure that um, you know if you're going to to deny people, you know liberty and, and justice, we have to make sure that, um, you know, the prosecutor proves the case and, and does a good job proving the case. And in, in this situation, this prosecutor didn't, and the charge was able to be reduced. You would know, have an enormous sympathy for her. It's clear. And she wrote about this in her memoir. She wrote about it and wrote about how she didn't want to represent this man but she there she had no choice she was appointed and this was you know this was something that she had to do and um you know she did her job and uh the charges were were ultimately um reduced <clears throat> and what happened um what happened and uh, again we'll tweet out the the link to this there was some question about the um, the evidence in the case. There was some question about um, the I believe the chain of custody and the handling of the evidence. And again, this you know this is a situation where you know, Hillary Clinton's just doing her job, and her job is to represent this man and make sure the prosecutor proves its case. And in, in, in the end, the prosecutor. Um, was going to have difficulty doing difficulty doing that because of the mistakes that they made, and 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 she, you know, negotiated this plea uh, this plea deal, and you know it you know you might not like the result, but that's how our criminal justice system works, and and again I think that. Because Hillary Clinton is an attorney, and because she is so smart, and because she is so accomplished, and because she is probably more often than not the smartest person in the room, that's hard for us collectively as a society to to deal with. It's hard for us to, um, you know, it's it's okay for a man to be that, to be this um this accomplished to be this smart to be um a, a mover and a shaker to be powerful but we still i think struggle when 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 it's a woman and uh, i think that that is in large part responsible for you know for how we we perceive these things but again there's no there's no evidence here that even remotely suggests that because Hillary Clinton did her job, she doesn't support women and she didn't, um, you know, that she had some sort of personal agenda, some vengeance against Kathy Shelton. It's just not there. But yet she's another woman who, who does support Donald Trump. And now we come to the Big Apple, the defining moment, the moment that um, that I want to talk about the important moment, and that is why would these four women support Donald Trump? Why? I can understand them having, you know, negative thoughts and feelings and what have you toward Bill Clinton, and I can even sort of understand, even understand why they might feel the way that they feel toward Hillary Rodham Clinton. But why support Donald Trump? Why support someone who is equally, if you believe Bill Clinton, if, if, and I'm not saying not to, but if, if you're Paula Jones and you and, and Bill Clinton did this to you and you believe that he is a sexual harasser, why would you support Donald Trump, who is as bad, if not worse, than what you believe about Bill Clinton? I do not get it. I don't understand it. I don't understand how any of these women, if, if, 
and I'm on board with believing how they can think Bill Clinton is this horrible, terrible person and yet support a Donald Trump who is as bad, if not worse. I do not get that. To me, it is mind-boggling. Why not Jill Stein? Why not Gary Johnson? But no, you support him. Listen, you watched a man sexually harass a reporter, a Hollywood reporter, in a video wanting to Broderick, and all you had to say was, well, he said bad things. No, he was sexually harassing this woman. How can you support this? I don't understand. I want to ask you. I believe you, but I want to ask you how you can support Donald Trump. I, I want to ask how any of you can. Kathy Shelton, Donald Trump, has he is right now the subject of a lawsuit by a child, by someone who was a child when – there was a claim of rape. How, how I don't understand how you can support this man. I understand why you can't support Bill Clinton. I understand why you might feel the way you do about Hillary Clinton, but how can you support Donald Trump? I do not get it. I don't get how any of you can do it. It's mind-boggling to me that that you can support this man. We'll take another quick break. When we come back, we're going to wrap things up. So stay tuned in. You're listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. All right, welcome back. You're listening to Bat Talk with Sharona. I am your host. My name is Sharona. We did it. We finally did it. It was as hard as I expected, but we finally had this discussion that I've been wanting to have about Juanita Broderick, about Kathy Shelton, about Paula Jones, about Kathleen Wiley, and, and I hope that we handled it in a sensitive manner. Um, I, again, it's I understand the desire to be to be believed. I understand the desire to, um, you know, to want to live in a perfect world where, you know, mothers can prevent their, their children from being abused and have that much control over the men in their lives that, um, you know, that that's possible. And, you know, no wonder how many women out there listening out there, not listening out there, how many women out there have feelings about their own mothers, sisters, aunts, family members, such as we discussed at, uh, in the How to Get Away with Murder scene between Cicely Tyson and Viola Davis, and you know, wish you know their family member had been able to pre- to prevent you know some things from happening to them. It's you know, it's not. It's not an easy, there are no easy answers here, um, except to say that by talking about these things, maybe we can make a difference. Maybe we can save a child. Maybe we can save a woman. Maybe we can make the world a better place. Silence is not the answer. And um, we're committed on this show to doing as much as we can to to shine a light on uh, on how hard these questions are and how hard that they can be and you know it's it, it's interesting and I, and I meant to say this earlier I want to finish up with this and, and how I walked away from it with so much respect for Hillary Clinton because I do think that it was for me one of her it, it was one of her best hours and the you know the the thing that um that I forgot to mention that I want to mention is that you know there were a couple of questions I thought that were <clears throat> they've been getting a lot of press and and initially I thought that they 
I understood the questions, but now I'm like, oh, you know what? They're they're kind of hard questions, and maybe questions that um, that were a bit unfair. And the the first one has to do with her deplorable comments. And um, I'm about to lose my voice. Hopefully, we've only got about ten more minutes. Hopefully, hopefully I can get through this without losing it. The deplorables question And I thought that she handled it About as well as she possibly could Because you know she did say that But you know what at this point It should be pretty clear That there Is a portion I don't want to say all of them I like to believe the best in people But there's certainly a portion Of Donald Trump supporters Who are pretty terrible people um, for whom the the word deplorable certainly does fit, and they wear that. You know, I mean, look out on your you know, you can look out on the internet, and they wear that. You know, they're happy to be deplorable. They're happy to be terrible people. They're they're happy to harass women and use the c word and the b word and um and and, and all of these things and to think Hillary Clinton should be killed and shot and all kinds of terrible things happen to her. Um, you know, it's unfair, I think, to ask Hillary Clinton to defend people for whom there is no defense. You know, I mean, there are some terrible people in this world. Um I, I think that she generally does want to unite this country, but there are going to be some people who are never going to get on board with her, who are never going to let them unite her. But again, we're holding her responsible for having to try to do that. And I think that that's unfair. I think I think that that's an unfair standard. And the second thing is um, at the end, and at the time I thought it was a good question, but asking them to say something good about each other. Uh, I would really struggle to find something good to say. And um, and again, I thought she handled that as well as she possibly could. But you know, it, it wasn't uh, on. In retrospect, it was I think a a, a bad question. And um, sometimes you got to call a spade a spade. And you know. When people are terrible, you have to say that they're terrible. And there certainly are some terrible people in this world. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, you've been listening to Bat Talk with Sharon. A shout out once again to Robin Mundy. He joined me in our first hour talking about the Buffalo Bills, Tyrod Taylor, uh, the job that Rex and Rob Ryan are doing there, the firing of Greg, Greg Roman, and, and all of that. Robin's a wonderful person. I'm so thankful to call her my friend. We'll be tweeting out links to where you can find her, where you can find her work, where you can find the article that we discussed about for for the Bills Wire, talking about situational football. Um, and we finally did it. We finally had our discussion about the Clinton accusers. I hope that, again, I hope that we handled that in a sensitive manner. I hope that we um, we did not... Yeah. I have some I have a lot of sympathy for these women and 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 I tried I did the best that I could to try to handle that in in, in a sensitive manner. Uh we'll be back on Friday if my if my voice doesn't go away. We'll be back on Friday with another show. Uh we'll be sitting down with Matt Wood tonight for our chopping it up the security um, breach there and the, the sexual discrimination lawsuit, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, we'll be uh, talking about more. I'm going to be joining my friends, uh, Chels and Rita, the NFL chick, uh, for their podcast. I'm, I'm, I'm like giddy. I'm girl crushing, absolutely. So uh, we'll be tweeting out a link to that and going for two will not be tonight. It'll be tomorrow night. And I'll tweet out a link to that. You can follow me, by the way, on Twitter at Sports by Sharona. You can check out my work at Inside the Pylon, NFL Female, and Pro Player Insiders. I just did an article where I took a look at Jace Amaro. You can follow my journey through DFS, 
We'll also, by the way, be talking about fantasy football on Friday. We have not yet booked a guest for that. We're going to be, um, we'll be doing that either today or tomorrow. If you want to be a guest on the show, hit me up. Always looking for people with different ideas, with their, with different opinions, diversity and variety. So um, if you want to be a guest on the show, you can hit me up at Sports by Sharon and let me know that. And I hope that you have happy Wednesday, by the way, happy hump day. Hope that you have a wonderful day, a wonderful rest of the week. And again, we'll, we will be back on Friday. The show will air as it typically does at 10 o'clock AM barring anything unforeseen. And um, you can uh, look for details about that. So um, have a great day and we'll be back on Friday.